We get a morning sit down, everyone. Good getting internet. Mm, my throat's scratchy. There, I should have cleared my throat a little bit. It's a little scratchy. Isun ate all of the food in his bowl last night and was whining and whining this morning over his lack of food in his food bowl, having to wait a whole half an hour. Ugh. Local cat's never been fed in his life. Do you see what I mean by they're obviously really close to each other without any issues? It's so weird. It's like as long as I'm sitting down here, Isun's not really afraid. Heading downstairs, Isun. But you come in for more pets. Hmm. Kid cat. You're purring. It soon purrs really easily. Oh, now he's decided to get slightly scared. Oh, it sounds almost done with breakfast, Kit Kat. I need to clean your litter box this morning. And so Kitty's done with breakfast. Nope, not quite. There's a couple of kibble left. Now, oh, nope, a little bit more. Now he's done. Good kitty cat. Meow. And looks like breakfast time is over. I keep covering up the camera. Hello once more. Don't need the hat on, I'm underneath a gazebo. Um, no, that's not a green screen behind me. For some reason, to me, at least in the selfie cam, it looks like it's one. Um, so, ah, today's subject. Um, so, something that people have talked about in the past when it comes to me specifically is that I don't seem depressed. Um, it's a stereotype, you know. Um, the people who actually have Depression tend to not be the ones that seem like they have depression, so to speak. And yes, I do. So I wanted to briefly go over, you know, well, a lot. <laughs> uh, it's really hard to briefly go over something that's been shaping my life for such a long time. But, um, so I go through, I treat my depression using something called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBD. It's one of the most common forms of helping treat. Uh, it's talk therapy basically. And that's the method that seems to work best for me. I need somebody to talk to. It's probably due to the way my ADHD functions is that like even not talking about like health matters, if I need to figure something out, the best way for me to figure something out is to literally talk with somebody else about it. Even if that somebody else knows nothing about what I'm talking about. Um, it's, in programming terms, it's used as the term rubber duck debugging, where basically you talk to a rubber duck and you figure out your problem because you're actually talking it out. That's the way my brain works, which is probably part of the reason why CBD works very well for me. Having said that, um, I'm actually not talking about my therapy in this case. I'm talking about 
what I have or my symptom list, so to speak. So editor me, uh, let me actually make things a little easier. I'll shift over slightly. So editor me has some space to edit over there. Um, editor me, go ahead and throw up the current list of medical notes from my, I should probably move this back a little bit. There we go. Um, currently list of notes from my last medical appointment with my therapist. So that really freaking long list of notes is actually what my symptom list and diagnosis are. So let's go through them. I made a copy. Oop. Please do not drop stylus. That would be bad. Ah, don't throw stylus either. Stylus is expensive. Stylus. I'm just going to put that back into the phone before I do something bad. Yep. Okay, so I have my list of, I have a copy of it right here from my tablet, and I'm going to go over them. So, um, current symptoms and problems. These are things that my therapist has identified as, hey, look, these are the problems. This is what this is showing up as. So, um, anxiety slash phobia and anxious slash nervous mood. I do, in fact, have diagnosed anxiety issues, plural just for fun, avoidant behaviors that interfere with functioning or cause distress. So um, many people will notice that I will actually start avoiding things unconsciously. And even when I consciously think about it, I can't tell you why I'm avoiding doing something. Whether that avoidant behavior be starting the job search, that's actually a great example of an avoidant behavior for me. Or just, I'm anxious about something so I want to avoid it as much as I can. Difficulty concentrating or mind going blank due to anxiety. Oh, this was very common toward the end of my um, employment at Epic. Um, basically, I would have what I referred to as stare at a wall time, where I would come home from work, whether that was during the pandemic, so work from home and just moving from my office setup to my home setup, or literally coming home via commute. And... I effectively just stared at a wall. I would sit down in front of my computer desk and kind of just stare. I'd randomly maybe turn on some music, maybe have YouTube videos playing, but I wouldn't be able to tell you what was going on in said video. I, you could have turned off the screen and it was probably just as effective for me to just sit down and stare. My stare at a wall time toward the end of my employment at Epic started reaching five, six hours. Uh, effectively, I would work for eight hours, commute to and from work, so consider that an extra hour total, uh, assuming that I'm not taking the bus, and come home after the commute from home, stare at a wall for six hours, remember, oh yeah, I need to eat, try to quickly make something to eat, immediately go to bed. Rinse, repeat. This is a really common way that my brain handles anxiety is that it tries to calm itself down by doing nothing. So um, to say that I had difficulty concentrating would be a slight understatement. My brain actually had started trying to do that during working hours with how bad things eventually got. So continuing on, muscle tension, aches, or soreness. Um, that's a pretty common stress response for everyone, so I don't think I'm particularly rare in that regard. Um, nausea or abdominal distress. So this was especially the case when I was a kid. The way I handled stress when I was a kid is that my stomach would drop. Um, I would also start having intestinal cramping, where... The way I've had it described, um, for those of you that may have the correct parts, it's a lot like having a period. Uh, the main difference being that I do not have said biological parts in my body to have one. And what would happen is that my intestines would actually just clench. And anything that happened to be in said intestines caused lots and lots of pain. Um, give you an idea on level of pain, if I had an intestinal cramp as I was walking along, before I started getting used to them, unfortunately, and before I started finding coping mechanisms, there's a very good chance I would vomit mid-stride because the pain was way too sharp. It is the most painful thing I've ever dealt with, and I've had kidney stones, keep in mind. Um, that slowly stopped happening. My 
I have had intestinal cramps as an adult, but they don't happen anywhere near as often as they did as a kid, even though I'm more stressed. Uh, the reason being is that I, my body has other stress responses now. So the nausea comes in frequently for me. Um, if you're talking to me, there's a very, and I'm not actively eating, there's a very good chance I'm at least somewhat nauseous. Um, I'm actually somewhat nauseous right now, but that's less to do with anxiety and stress and more to do with the fact that I haven't eaten anything today. And it's 14.04. Um, noisy vans. And the reason why I haven't eaten anything today is that I forgot. I wasn't particularly hungry this morning, and by the time I realized, hmm, I can go for something to eat, looked at the time, I went, oh, house cleaners are supposed to arrive in a minute. Yeah. <clears throat> That's also why I'm outside, for reference, is that my house cleaners are currently cleaning my house, so I don't want to be in there. Anyway, continuing on the list, um, obsessive thinking. Oh boy, do I have that. You can even see that in the video that maybe editor me will even remember to put in a card when I was talking about my vet trip. Um, a very common response for me if I am by myself. Um, strangely enough, being in front of a camera doesn't count as being by myself. Part of the reason why Vita is actually a thing that I continue trying to do. Um, my brain just starts spiraling whenever I'm by myself. Uh, it's unfortunate because my partner and I are very different people. My partner needs alone time. Quite a bit of alone time. They're not used to being around people very often. They are very introverted. I am the opposite. I need to be around people because otherwise I'm alone in my thoughts, and being alone in my thoughts is dangerous. Now, I don't think people realize what I mean by saying being alone in my thoughts is dangerous. I am not using that in hyperbole. I am not saying, hey, look, I'm going to start thinking bad stuff if I'm alone in my thoughts. No. I am literally saying that it is a hazard to my health for me to be by myself, alone in my thoughts for too long. How long is too long depends on, well, what else is going on. Right now, it's not as big of a deal. Um, I'm not particularly stressed out at the moment. I'm relatively calm. My blood pressure is fairly normal. I'll get to that in a moment. And I'm generally doing okay. But if I'm having a bad day, or if I'm stressed out about anything, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be work-related, it could be the fact that I'm dealing with movers that don't actually want to let me at my mother's things. It could even just be having to deal with too many things on my plate for one day. That's the type of scenario that causes me to start spiraling. And I will spiral down and down and down. I mean, to give you an idea, my brain was trying to convince me during that vet appointment that the vet had somehow gotten things mixed up and killed my cat. That's completely irrelevant. It has no bearing on reality whatsoever. That's the way my obsessive thinking works. Panic attacks. Yeah, um, I have panic attacks. I have anxiety attacks. I've even recorded an anxiety attack that's happened where I just burst into tears. Um... For me, the way I define the difference between a panic attack and an anxiety attack is that the anxiety attack I can usually function in the middle of. Um, I will... Obsessive anxious thinking is probably about the best way I can phrase it. I start roombaing, where I just start bouncing back and forth between thoughts repeatedly without actually being able to focus on anything. A panic attack, on the other hand, my heart rate will start skyrocketing I'll start having heart palpitations. I'll have a lot of physical signs of distress during a panic attack. So, slight difference there. Poor coordination. I'm not entirely sure where that comes from. It's probably just I have a tendency to not be able to walk very well if I'm too anxious. But I don't really agree with that particular symptom. Trouble falling or staying asleep. So, fun fact... I, my sleep is very orderly disordered, for lack of a better way of phrasing it. So it used to be that I would go to bed every night at approximately 22 to 22.30, and I would sleep for seven and a half or nine hours. I would sleep straight. I might briefly wake up, but so little of a brief, or so little time that I don't even remember waking up. That's 
normal for me. What's happened more recently is that I have insomnia now. Um, I'm not going to bed until closer to midnight, and the reason being is that I don't want to be not around other people. I, most of my friends are night owls, which means that I try to stay up to make sure I can interact with them. It's not great, but that's the way my brain is working, even if I'm not actually interacting with them. That's the fun part. It doesn't matter. Um, and then I will frequently wake up at about 5, 5.30 in the morning, depending on exactly when I fell asleep. Um, the way my body works, I have very strict hour and a half cycles. Uh, it's the way a lot of people work. It's just that mine are pretty much exactly an hour and a half long. So I will wake up mid-cycle. And if I wake up too late in the morning, usually sometime between... And if I wake up sometime between 5... Really just 5 and beyond, I will stay awake. Regardless of how little sleep I've had. I won't be able to fall asleep. I will start overheating. This is apparently a symptom of my depression. Which I didn't realize. Uh, in addition... So that mentions both, oh yeah, sorry, that's a later one. Worrying. Gee, I don't worry about things, do I? Practically my job description before was worrying about things, trying to plan for various events, planning on what could possibly go wrong. Like for instance, a worldwide global epidemic that causes people not be able to fly into this area. That was actually one of the things that I worked on when I was at Epic. Um, family problems, fiancé lives in Norway. That's obviously not a symptom of my depression. I mean, yes, I would like my partner to live closer to the place that I live so I can see them more often, but, I mean, I guess it's more of a, uh, I know there's a term for it, but my brain's blanking on it, um, more of a secondary effect. It's not caused by depression, it's not causing my depression, but it is making some of the symptoms worse, because I can't be around people. Mood slash effect disturbance crying. Oh boy, do I cry a lot. Um, before I gave my notice at Epic, I was crying on average of a couple of times a day, and it's not just a brief five-second couple of tears. No, it was pretty detailed. Um, crying is the way the body relieves some forms of stress. And I'm pretty certain that's what my body was doing. It doesn't take much to make me cry, even now. Even though I'm doing significantly better than I was before. And keep in mind, I'm reading off my notes from my most recent appointment with my therapist, which is yesterday. So, significantly after I left Epic. Depressed mood. Well, yeah, I'm de diagnosed with depression. I'm going to have a depressed mood. Uh, that happens often. Uh, excessive feelings of guilt slash worthlessness. Yeah, um, I feel guilty for various actions that I take, even though I've been repeatedly told by lots of people, including my therapist, including friends, including family, that there's absolutely no reason for me to take blame for anything. Anything related to that. That's not to say that I'm completely blameless on everything that I do. Obviously, there are things that I do that are incorrect, and it's my fault, and I should fix it. But most times, it's... Excessive, as the notes say. Um, here's a good example. So, the last place that I actually had an interview at, um, this is before I left Epic. This was a couple of years ago now, I think. Oh, definitely more than two years ago. It might have been three. Anyway, um, I had interviewed at a place, and I felt guilty afterward because I did not accept their job offer. Mind you, their job offer was, well, health insurance was utter garbage, and it come to find out from friends later on that the job itself would have been utter, utter garbage too, and I would have actually been worse off. But I felt guilty about wasting their time. I was in a job interview. That's literally the point of the job interview, is for you to interview the company and the company to interview you. Ha! This guilt episode lasted days um, because I felt like I was manipulating them. I mean, that's literally what you do in a job interview is that you get them to see your way. That's manipulation. 
Worthlessness, though, um, yeah, my self-esteem is kind of a hot mess. Um, I may have some self-esteem when it comes to some of the things that I do, but I don't actually view myself as valuable as a person, nine times out of ten. Logically, if I think about it enough, yeah. I mean, I would never consider a random person on the street valueless, but I consider myself valueless? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so that's a very common thing. Helplessness. Um, have I mentioned that we've been in a pandemic for the past year and a half? Yeah, my feelings of helplessness predate the pandemic, but um, I feel as though that I my hands are tied and I don't really have any options and I can't help myself, can't help others constantly. It's, and that ties right into hopelessness. It's the same situation, just, ah, uh, yeah. I, so, something of a note, I have zero plans beyond moving to Norway. I have no idea what I'm going to do when I arrive. I mean, yeah, in general, I should probably find a way of making money. At some point, I would like to not live in an apartment and move into my own housing of some variety once I move to Norway. I'm not going to be buying a house when I first arrive because that would be very silly. But that's it. That's where my plans end. I don't see a future. And it sucks. I also don't see a future in the United States right now, which is part of the reason why I'm leaving, but that's neither here nor there. Impaired daily functioning. So this is a key part of the reason why when a form is asking me, am I disabled, my answer is yes. Depression, especially what mine is like, is a disability. And it impairs me on a daily basis. Constantly, in fact. Um, I cannot be the person that I know that I'm capable of being because my brain just starts sapping all of my positive emotions away. I start obsessing whenever I'm by myself, even though being by myself is still healthy. It's just really, really bad. Uh, indecisiveness. So some of this is really mundane. Like, for instance, I can never decide where to eat or games to play. And some of this is the fact that it took me three years to actually make the decision to move to Norway, um, even though that was the obvious choice. And it took me five years to make the decision to leave Epic. Yeah, um, I've been indecisive for a long period of time. Personally, I didn't view that as related to my depression, but given how long I've been in a severe depression, that's not too surprising that I wouldn't relate it. Um, insomnia, I already mentioned that. Problems falling asleep. Uh, low interest and, or loss of interest and pleasure. So again, I'm, I don't feel happiness very often. I fake it a lot. Um, I will fake excitement because I know I should be excited. It's kind of like the logical part of my brain tells the emotional part of my brain, awesome, this is something you've been looking forward to. Sweet, get ready for fun. And my emotional brain goes, ooh. Yeah, so um, the best way I can describe it is kind of like having a dark cloud over all of your thoughts or a fog or something like that. You may shine, actually fog is a good example. You may shine a bright light in a fog but that light doesn't go very far. Even though it's super bright, and if the fog wasn't there, it'd go really, really far, especially a spotlight, it doesn't go as far as it should. And that has been one of my perpetual main symptoms that pointed me toward, yeah, now I'm depressed. Um, low self-esteem, previously mentioned. Uh, marked mood shifts. Oh boy, do I have mood shifts. So you don't get to see them on camera very often, but... Um, while the fog depresses my ability to feel pleasure and happiness, it amplifies my ability to get very, very angry. Um, it's not that I'm being angry at a particular person. I tend to bottle up my emotions when I feel that because I don't feel as though most people deserve my ire. 
even when I'm in a very uncomfortable situation. So for an example, that mo those movers that I mentioned before, um, the movers, I did not get angry at the person telling me, hey, look, you can't get at your mom's things for a week. I got angry after. Sort of. See, I was actually angry the entire time. I just swallowed up the anger, behaved very politely, and later on, blew up. Um, my mood shifts toward negative directions quite rapidly, and it sucks. Because I don't control it. All I can do is think of it like being on a sailboat, and the wind changes suddenly. You can adjust your sails to tack into the wind and so on, but you're still dealing with that wind. That's kind of the way my mood shifts feel to me. Recurrent thoughts of death, recurrent suicidal ideation without a specific plan. Yes, I am classified as suicidal. I usually am, in fact. Um, no, I do not have a plan or anything like that, and I have no intention of actually ending my own life. Um, but that doesn't mean the thoughts don't constantly crop up in my head. And I will not act on them. I know I won't act on them, but from an outside observer, yeah, no, it's really scary. Now, having said that, I haven't had anything like that recently. Uh, it's been a while since I've had the last thought like that pop up into my head. Would have been early on in the pandemic, I think, was the last time. Symptoms cause significant clinical distress. Uh, this is the part where they're referring to the fact that my blood pressure skyrockets. Um, to give you an idea, the a normal, normal range human adults of my age should have blood pressure that's below 120 systolic and 80 diastolic. With my medication, I'm at about 120 systolic and about 70-ish diastolic, so I'm perfectly fine with my medication right now, which is good. That's excellent news. Prior to the start of my current bout of medication, my normal resting blood pressure, so sitting down, not recently exercised or anything like that, was 225 systolic and 110 diastolic. Or, get your posterior to the emergency room now levels. That was my normal resting blood pressure. When I was in distress, for instance, when I had appendicitis, um, they actually had to emergency drop my blood pressure like a rock because I was registering. I didn't see the diastolic, but I saw the systolic and the first digit was a three. And I'm pretty sure the second digit was not a zero. So I've had really bad blood pressure and it's related to my anxiety disorder, which is related to my clinical depression. Um, in addition, I have lots of other clinical issues. Um, for instance, because my blood pressure is high, I have liver damage. Um, my liver is, I think I saw it listed as moderate damage. And I also have an enlarged, enlarged spleen now that is likely as a result of the stresses that my body's been put under. My... This is what I mean by I am disabled. I basically... I'm not employed right now, and I'm barely maintaining normal. Let's go into the mental status, shall we? Um, my appearance is well-groomed. Why, thank you. To be fair, I do tend to shave at least a couple of days before talking with my therapist, but I also do that a couple of days before talking with anyone. I just haven't been doing it for the vlogs all that often because it's a daily vlog and I don't feel like shaving daily when I'm not working or anything like that. Uh, concentration is normal. I am capable of concentrating on things. It's something that I've learned to have to do. Um, intelligence is normal. Okay. Uh, speech is at normal rate and tone. I have had that change at various points. If the more anxious I am, the faster I speak. Until I shut up. It's one of the two. It doesn't do both. Um, you probably can even look back in previous vlogs and see that happen. Eye contact... Er, speech is... Yeah, I already went through speech. Eye contact is good. I have the ability to brighten my eyes. Uh, my orientation is full. That is to say that I am focusing on the person that I'm speaking to. Uh, my cognitive behavioral therapy appointments are through 
my camera. Um, because my therapist is way over on the other side of Madison. And at the start of the pandemic, we gained the ability to do video chat based therapy. And we've both agreed that, yeah, no, we're going to continue doing video chat even post pandemic because screw that noise. Um, thoughts are logical, organized, and goal directed. I, that's the way I tend to think, which is part of the reason why I'm so concerned about me not having any goals past moving to Norway, is that I always have goals. Um, within, was it second month of moving to Madison and working for Epic, I had a little notebook, and I doubt I'm going to be able to find where I put said notebook because I don't remember where it's at now, but I wrote down in a little notebook goals for myself. Those goals... I achieved the last goal last year, almost a year ago today, in fact. So yeah, I'm a long-term planner. Um, judgment insight are good. Client did not exhibit any formal thought disorders. Um, client was able to answer questions spontaneously and directly. Client comments were logical and presented in organized fashion. Client exhibits no paranoia, hallucina hallucinations, delusions, mania, or phobias. Uh, the last part. I don't demonstrate phobias because my phobias are actually, um, my phobias aren't something that come up on a day-to-day -day basis. I am technically pyrophobic, um, and I believe that is now an official diagnosis for me, but that's, I'm not exactly around fire constantly, so that doesn't come up on a daily basis. Diagnosis axis one, major depressive disorder, recurrent episode, severe. I am considered to have severe depression, and it is constant. I can be in a very happy mood and a happy place. I still have depression. I can be in a very sad mood. That's not, hey, look, depression is come back. It's always been there. It's just that sometimes I choose not to hide it, and sometimes it just affects me less. Um, depressive symptoms over the two-week period include depressive mood for most of the day, nearly every day. Uh, yep, that's accurate. Uh, markedly diminished interest and pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, nearly every day. Yeah. Uh, insomnia, hypersomnia, nearly every day. Psychomotor agitation or retardation, nearly every day. Uh, that's not actually accurate for me, I think, but that's neither here nor there. Fatigue or loss of energy, nearly every day. So one of the things that came up is that it's really hard to tell whether it is depression or depression plus chronic fatigue disorder because I have massive amounts of fatigue. Um, I will be exhausted after filming this video. I walked a block. <laughs> uh, this is not physically demanding for me at all. It's the fact that I'm churning through my own symptoms, which are going to cause me to focus on it, which is going to lead to massive amounts of fatigue. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt nearly every day, yeah. Diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness nearly every day. Something that got commented on. So when I was working at Epic um, toward the end, I was forced slash enforced myself to take a four week mental health break. Um, as in my doctors were going to force it on me, whether I agreed to it or not, but I'm the one that actually proposed it to begin with. Um, after those four weeks, keep in mind, it was just four weeks. It took maybe a day or two for my blood pressure to drop down to normal. And after those four weeks, I came back and my supervisor had mentioned to me after being there for about a week, it was like the old me had come back. My capability of thinking and concentration are severely diminished when I'm dealing with anxiety. And there's a plane that's going overhead. One moment. There, that's better. Um... What was I talking about? Oh, right. Um, the old me had come back. Basically, I was able to think five different thoughts concurrently and wrap my heads around my head, singular, but there's, there's no extra head on my shoulder, um, wrap my head around very complex subjects immediately with absolutely no issues. That's the way I normally behave. It's the way I think. Um, I can't remember who mentioned it, but a friend of mine had mentioned it's kind of like my brain uses swarm tactics. I'm not necessarily, okay, if there's a problem here, I'm thinking about like 12 different ways around it or solving it or something like that at the exact same moment I'm analyzing the problem to begin with. I do knows. That's the way I normally think. Right before taking that mental health break, 
I wasn't able to do any of that. I couldn't concentrate enough. My thought process is basically go, oh, there's a problem. Let's look at the problem. Oh no, how do we handle this? Ah, uh, yeah, that's the way I was functioning. So, symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. Long story short, yes, I am disabled. I cannot function at a normal level because of my depression. That doesn't mean I cannot function. I am obviously functional most of the time. It doesn't mean that I cannot hold employment. Um, mostly because I live in the United States and trying to get a disability ruling for a mental illness like depression is borderline impossible. Basically depends on the judge that you get on any given day. A judge might believe that there's no such thing as depression and just rule against you immediately regardless of evidence. On the plus side, I am capable of functioning. Um, I just need to be able to step away and calm down. I need to be able to take breaks, and preferably I would need to be able to actually not work eight hours a day, but unfortunately that's not going to happen in modern society. All right, subjective. Shivers attended a mental health session due to concerns related to managing low mood and high amounts of stress. We discussed this trip to Florida to try to take care of his mother's belongings and ended up not being able to do this, which was disappointing. Um, again, my, meeting, uh, my therapy appointment was yesterday. Um, talking about the things that happened in the past four weeks because I have therapy appointments every three to four weeks and yeah the last thing that happened in the past four weeks was my trip to Florida and dealing with all that garbage um, he also had a lot of trouble getting back to Madison due to flight problems we discussed how he is managing the search for a job and how this is impacted by his past history of difficult times in finding a job so one of the reasons why I have such a problem with job hunting is that I have had two major episodes of massive amounts of unemployment. I was unemployed for nine months before accepting my job at Epic, and I was employed, unemployed for nine months prior to that job as well. It is mostly due to the fact that I have such low self-esteem that it shows up in my resume. Um, it's actually the reason why I'm going to be paying somebody to write my resume, or revise my resume for me, because I'm really bad at selling myself. We discussed ways to begin the process and to combat the negative self-talk that can come up due to his history. Um, basically, what happens when I job hunt is effectively like if I am dealing with a um, major negative event. Um, my therapist had mentioned that it seems that it, the job hunt affected me, like when I was trying to job hunt before, it affected me worse than my appendicitis. It's just, my brain just goes, uh, everything's horrible, terrible, why are you stressing yourself out this much? So I fully expect when I start intensively job hunting, my blood pressure is going to spike because that's the way my body handles these things now. Risk assessment. Patient endorses suicidal idolation and or plan. Patient reports occasional fleeting, vague thoughts of self-harm. Patient agrees no self-harm or will call mental health provider as needed. Basically, no, I'm not going to hurt myself intentionally. And if I do have those feelings, I'm going to give my therapist a call. I have had to do that before. Um, I've had to call her twice. Uh, that was around the time that my mom died. So I was rumbling around being indecisive about whether I go visit or it was right before my mom died I should say oh well, the first one was before my mom died and I had just come back from visiting and now she went into hospice uh, my aunt and one of her children went to visit my mom and I was trying to decide between whether I go visit again or not and I decided against it because one I would have had to have taken a lot of time off of work and rather it be low stress, it'll be super high stress because I don't have a place to sleep other than my mom's hospital room, or hospice room in that case. And two, I already said my goodbyes. And my mom understood why I had to leave early and so on because I was well beyond my capacity of functioning. Um, I actually don't remember my flight back at all because I wasn't, I wasn't really contributing things to my memory. 
that's kind of the way things go for me. If my anxiety reaches too high, not only do I start having physiological problems, I start losing memory. Massive amounts of memory, in fact. All right. Um, patient is told about emergency resources, how to access, access them. Therapist has discussed reasons for living, has safety agreement with therapist and or hospital, family slash support system notified and involved. Basically, yes, I am open about the fact that I have severe depression. I rely upon my friends and family, really not my family anymore because they're all dead. Um, I rely on my friends for it comes to handling these things. Um, and they know about this. They don't know that I'm recording this video. They'll probably find out when it goes live. But yeah, treatment plan. Follow up psychotherapy appointments with this mental health provider with the following goals, treatment, and estimated time frame. Psychotherapy goals. Shivers will develop strategies for effectively managing stress. Uh, oh, by the way, this treatment plan's been there for the, I think I've been seeing my therapist for four years now? Four? Five? Something like that? It, it's a copy and paste from all of us. Um, two, shivers will make lifestyle choices to support positive coping strategies, treatment modularity, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness techniques, and skills practice, relaxation, skills training, stress management techniques, and supportive therapy. Basically, yeah, I'm attending therapy for this. I am trying to find ways of calming myself down and relaxing. So far, the only thing that seems to work is coloring, but that only works if I'm not already roombaing with my mind. So if I have a moderate level of anxiety, I can calm myself down by coloring. If I have a massive amount of anxiety, like for instance, what was happening with at the vet, coloring doesn't work. I can't focus enough to start. Frequency of appointments, routine or bi-weekly mental health appointments. So I'm actually supposed to have this every other week, but my therapist isn't available every other week. Um, she's booked solid usually for uh, I have to make two appointments in advance because it's impossible for me to just book four weeks out. I have to book eight weeks out or six, six to eight weeks out. Length of treatment estimate, six to 10 psychotherapy sessions. It said six to 10 for m many years now. Provided contact information and thoroughly discussed how to access services with GHC mental health department, including after hours and weekend emergency care coverage. Basically, call me if you need me, push comes to shove, go to urgent care. That are the notes for my roughly monthly one-hour session of cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy. Like I said from the start, just because you see smiles on my face doesn't mean that I'm not depressed. Just because I am laughing doesn't mean I'm not depressed. I am depressed, and I will probably be depressed forever. It's the default state for my mind at this point as an adult. I have had to deal with depression since at least since I was 16. That's the first time it got diagnosed, but most likely it actually had started significantly earlier. Um, there's going back after speaking with my therapist, going back through my memories and history, I actually noticed the symptoms as young as I would have been 10. So yeah, my brain don't work properly, but I am getting better. Um, for reference, I am not on any medications that help with anxiety or depression. That's not to say that, that's not to say that I don't agree with people being on said medications. It's just that I have such really nasty side effects with everything that I do or every medication that I take that I've had an extremely nasty side effect with uh, antidepressants before. Both my therapist and my primary care physician um, agree that it's probably more risk than value. So one of the things that antidepressants can do, and the reason why it's labeled on antidepressants, is increased risk of suicide. Um, the reason being isn't that it gives you more suicidal thoughts so much as it gives you enough energy to act on them. And there is a significant danger for me and my style of depression of that happening if I went on antidepressants. In addition, uh, it seems as though any brain meds cause really weird problems with my head and we don't want to deal with it. So yeah. So it's been about 42 minutes of nothing but this conversation all in one take. Ha <laughs> ha.
I mean, I'd say I hope you enjoyed this internet, but this isn't exactly a fun subject. But I hope you've learned something today, internet. I'll talk to you next time. And maybe my housekeepers are done by now. Bye!